Hello again. Um, I'm Lucy Norton, the Managing Director at Iowa Renewable Fuels Association, and so um, in that role, I do manage the programs, uh, mark, or the association's marketing programs, which include E15, E85, uh, distillers grains, and in addition to that, our member services. Uh, prior to joining Iowa Renewable Fuels, I was the market development director for Iowa Corn, and while on staff, I helped in the formation of the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association. Today, you've heard uh, from a lot of presenters um, about the challenges, the obstacles uh, to expanding ethanol use and the availability of E15. We've got some very vocal opposition um, that's raised unwarranted, unsubstantiated claims for their own betterment. Um, I think uh, from time to time it does verge on ridiculous, and at some point, uh, if your GPS doesn't work in your car, you're going to be blamed because uh, you got ethanol in the tank, so you can't expect it to work. So I think things are, are sometimes verging on the totally ridiculous. So um, despite those who would prefer that motorists only have one choice at the pump, we have some very aggressive retailing pioneers um, that are boldly moving forward. Um, they're offering E15. Here in Iowa today, we have 14 retailers that have taken the step forward, and they are making E15 available for our customers with 2001 and newer vehicles. Um, these retailers have been reported increased sales in just the first month that they've offered that fuel. Um, we have one retailer here in Iowa who said after um, the first month, he had a $15,000 increase in his revenue once he put in a blender pump. And he saw this as a way to compete with other major retailers that were in town. This was his way as an independent to get a leg up on his competition. Um, he's offering E15, mid-level blends, E85, and he's selling about 3,000 gallons a month. Um, combined, um, his sales are increasing. He's so confident in E15 uh, that he gives an unconditional guarantee of that product. So he's standing behind the quality, the suitability of E15 for the 2001 and newer vehicles. Um, we're also very excited that um, in the future, not far off, um, another major national retail chain, Murphy USA, has announced they're going to bring E15 to seven stations in Iowa, and that'll include Sioux City and Davenport. Um, so now that we're once again uh, blazing the trail for ethanol here in Iowa, we're seeing interest in other parts of the country. And you may have heard about this one, but Mapco um, Express just this month announced that it is going to be offering E15 to their customers. In their press release, they said that based on the performance of this product, our goal will be to add E15 to our mega stores. And so their goal is to put E15 in 100 stores. They're primarily in the uh, southeast, uh, but that's a significant uh, impact on E15. Last year at our summit, you heard from uh, Scott Zaremba, who's with Zarco 66, and he's put E15 in uh, all his stations in Kansas. Uh, since that time, he's dropped the 66 from his name. Um, he walked away from the contract that he had with a major oil company because they didn't want him to sell E15. And so his devotion to E15 is, is stronger than the expense that it costs uh, to cancel a contract with a major oil company. So we applaud him for, for that action. Um, we at Iowa RFA will help retailers putting in E15. We'll get them through and maneuver through the regulations at the federal level uh, that they have to go through in order to register to sell E15. Um, we will also provide marketing assistance. We have funding available for advertising to let their customers know uh, that they have uh, the latest ethanol option and the lowest cost ethanol option available. So we thank all the retailers that have moved forward, um, that have boldly entered into E15. We anticipate there's going to be many more in the future. Um, they have ch championed E15. They have proven there is no blend wall and the original RFS levels uh, for 2014 can be met uh, with E15 and higher 
ethanol blends. So now we're going to hear uh, from one of those entrepreneurs and one of those champions, an independent retailer and distributor uh, who recognizes the value of E15 to his business and to his customers, and that's Bruce Vollen. Bruce owns Vollen Oil based in Baltic, South Dakota. It's a full-service independent gas station, and uh, he's been part of this family-owned business for over 20 years. Um, he's been a pioneer in making E15 available and was one of the first in South Dakota to do so. Um, and he's expanded to, to E15, and he's here today to tell his story. So, Bruce? Thanks, Lucy. I'm going to make my very first attempt here at uh, doing a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation, so uh, please uh, keep your laughter to a dull roar for me. And no, this is not, uh, this is not modern day South Dakota gas station you're seeing here. Um, <clears throat> just a little something I found. We've actually got a, a website and it happens to be part of our history page. Uh, this is a, the 90th year that uh, that little wide spot on the road has been a, has been a gas station. So I just thought I'd have a little something to show you guys to compare what, uh, what things were before, well before blenders. Um, decision making process um, certainly came with a, a couple of really strong urges um, from in here and obviously from the consumer. You know, we kept hearing, you know, this is a, a little over our sixth year of doing blenders and at that point there was a lot of flex fuel vehicles on the road and we just got a lot of, a lot of input from producers, a lot of our customers are farm based people. So it, uh, it came down to making the decision, do we want to keep getting up, beating our head against the wall? Um, literally a family business. It was myself, my parents, and a, a part-time employee. You know, so we, we had a lot to, to look at as far as my parents were aging. Uh, business was pretty static. Um, provided a good living, but nothing extraordinaire. Um, in, in this world, it was either you're going to make acquisitions or you're going to sell your business. And, and quite honestly, we had no option for, uh, for either one of those other than to reinvest in ourselves. Um, the ability to differentiate ourselves from our customers up and down the street or, in our case, the road. Um, nobody has blender pumps. Nobody's done E15. Nobody's even done E85 you know, within 10 miles of us. And in, in Sioux Falls, when you're kind of on the north side, like we are, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stations on the fringes, uh, a lot of truck stops. So it was just a great way for us to set ourselves aside. Uh, and being an ethanol investor, I always wanted to be innovative and, and kind of answer those, uh, those questions for my customers. Why don't you have uh, ethanol at your pump other than E10? So it, it was a good reason for me to to kind of pay back the industry that actually started uh, at that point was being pretty good to its investors. Uh, profitability is, is I don't even know, it's, I, I certainly don't want to blow my own horn here when I say this, but when we flipped the switch on this thing uh, six years ago when we put blenders in, and this was prior to E15 obviously, I mean our sales went through the roof and in the sales of ethanol in particular. Um, you can blame it on having new facility, uh, new gas pumps. Not, it, we didn't necessarily have new facilities. We did a, uh, a new island with a canopy and, and two new dispensers. And essentially that was it. And overnight, it was times two on the gallons. And, that, and we did a pretty good volume for being a, a country store nevertheless. Um, the conversion process was... Um, was pretty simple in my mind. I've got a, I've got one of my best friends and mentors who's now in his 80s. Uh, always, always brings up the the saying that he said if it was up to now this is his wife speaking. If it was up to Shirley, we'd still be milking our same 10 cows. And quite honestly, if it was up to either my parents or the predecessors in this business to do just what we did every day, maintain status quo. Uh, we'd still be milking those same 10 cows. You know, I was kind of the, the prodder and, and actually at that point I was, uh, uh, we had incorporated and I was uh, a new owner in the business, so I wanted to keep this thing rolling. I needed something to do the rest of my life, obviously. 
Uh, so cheapest way is to milk those same 10 cows. That wasn't going to happen. Um, I want to sh see if I can show you a, a picture of what I'd actually... There you go. For some reason on Thanksgiving, I was at my parents' place and uh, just needed to get out of the house for a little bit. I took a little bit of a walk around their farm and out in the grove were our old gas pumps. I'm thinking, wow, six years ago. Thank goodness those things still are not in place. Um, so that would have been the cheap way. The most inexpensive way, and kind of like I told you, uh, an inexpensive way to do this improvement would have been just to put in new dispensers. The, the cheapest suction style dispensers you could do. Or you could go full route and spend all the money. And in this case, uh, at that point, blenders were another $6,000 over a conventional pump. Uh, and it was a no-brainer because that's what we wanted to do. You know, we wanted to sell ethanol. So we, we go ahead and went, uh, went and got some, some pricing and, and bid off our new blender pumps. Um, as far as the E15 conversion goes, um, I suppose this has been, uh, we've had E15 for a year and a half, a little over a year and a half now when the waiver was signed. When you've got blender pumps in place, the E15 is an absolute no-brainer. Um, anybody out there that has E15 and has not embraced E15, I'd just love to talk to them. Um, once the waiver was passed, and again, this was one of those things where we're getting pressure from the consumers, obviously, because they've heard of E15 for years now. And they're like, how come you don't put E15? And it's like, well, it's not necessarily a legal registered fuel. And I really want to do this the correct way. Um, so once the EPA waiver was in place, we, we did our due diligence with the EPA and registered with the, uh, I think I've got a little typo there, it's actually the RFGSA, um, an annual s survey that they come out and test your product periodically and, and you give them X amount of dollars per year. Uh, and then it just came down to pump programming and labeling. Um, and I think I've said this before, speaking down here at, uh, at the ACE conference, our total cost for E15 conversion, for one tech to come out, reprogram the pumps, and if I was smart enough, literally, it's a, it's a handheld device that looks like a TV remote. Uh, you could literally do this yourself. Some labeling, some vinyl. Uh, I spent less than 300 bucks converting my station to E15 uh, and just took out one of the least popular blends uh, and just to implement E15. The obstacles. I really struggled. Lucy's uh, saying, tell the people about what sort of obstacles you ran into when you did the E15 conversion. Um, probably the only complaint I had is what's taken so long with this. You know, where is the E15? We know you can do it, and you know, of course I've been chomping at the bit to do this for years. Uh, repairs, I've got a, a full service repair facility uh, along with our gas station. Trust me, I've seen, I've, I've yet to see a misfueling repair when somebody even actually misfuels their car with a high regimen of alcohol, let alone an E15 repair. I mean, you all have seen the news. You watch TV, you read publications, and God forbid you go to the internet and search out E15 because you can believe probably just a little less than 1% of what's out there. You know, big oil has pretty well got that flooded with misinformation. Um, so what I'm telling you, it's, it, it, is, it is definitely not something that is harmful to your vehicle, and I can attest to that through our volumes. Um, um, and kind of the repairs and expenses, I guess that's, that was meaning the same sort of thing. I've, I've spent nothing out of pocket to repair anybody's vehicle, nor have I even heard of a, an issue with E15. See what we've got next here. The positives. It's pretty easy, uh, and there's such a long list that I don't even know that I can hardly touch on all of them. Uh, instant growth in volume, like I told you, even when we put in our blender pumps to start with six years ago. Uh, it, I just got to tell you a little story that I kind of remembered uh, only a week ago in conversation with an industry friend. We were pretty tight for cash when we wanted to do this upgrade. 
Uh, and the bank said, you know, if you can find some alternative funding, you know, we'll help you out. I looked everywhere. Um, finally ended up with the state of South Dakota has what they call, um, might not even be able to remember what it's called. It is a loan program that they're willing to, it's a, it's a micro loan they call it. If you go through their phase of analysis and study and answer the questions correctly, they'll essentially loan you the money for 0% for and you can go to your lending institution to get the other half. So I went along with this and in the midst of the process with this analyst, she goes through everything, all of our books, all of our numbers, what we had, our, our placement in as far as, uh, you know, not necessarily doing a traffic study, but where our proximity was to small towns, to Sioux Falls. And she came up with a number that I thought was just ridiculous. She was pretty certain that we we're going to increase our volume by 30%. I'm thinking, well, that sounds great. I'd love to increase my volume by 30%. Looking back on this now, at today's numbers, we have increased, and, and this probably isn't necessarily to date. This is probably, we, we graduated to this um, within about the first two years of our blenders. We're at 300% of what we did prior uh, you know, to our improvement. So the instant growth in volume is there for everybody that's willing to embrace E15 blender pumps. Um, it used to be mom, pops, and Bruce. I've got a couple truck drivers. Uh, I've still got mom and pops. Uh, I've got a, an accountant and a bookkeeper in the office next to, to Tanya, who's my mother. Uh, I've got multiple part-time employees um, and a couple full-time employees that actually run the C-Store at this point. The RINs, um, kind of a kind of an interesting topic here, for, especially for us. Uh, we're blenders. We have uh, we're registered with the EPA, so we buy our ethanol or biodiesel on occasion. Take the RINs and sell them, and pass that back on to the the customer, which obviously turns into real savings. You know, this last year in particular, we have seen RINs go in excess of a dollar. Um, which also spurs on what we love to see happen without any coaching is the customer making the choice. You know, if you're going to pass this product on to the customer, pass through the savings with the RINs, I don't have to be out there giving testimonials saying, you know, I use E15 every day. So should you. They're going to look at it at the pumps. If I'm selling E15 right next to E10 or E0 and it's saving them 10 cents, maybe the margin gets down to a nickel. But those people constantly come back and buy E15 from us. See how well I can uh, read this chart from here. Obviously, our uh, our gallons of E10 are are pretty consistent, pretty static, 50% give or take, just a little bit all the time. Um, implementation of the E15. You can really see this, and I want to touch on just the RINs just a little bit with this slide, or even potentially the next one might uh, show it just a little bit better. But there was a real spike in the price of RINs, kind of mid-year, June, July, August. Uh, and you'll always see it's a little bit behind that curve. You know, someone as myself, as a retailer, I kind of need the assurance that I actually can get that real money out of that RIN. <coughs> Excuse me before I can pass it on to the consumer. I mean, that RIN could essentially fall out of bed and go back to zero where it was uh, uh, at the beginning of last year. And I'd hate to be sitting on heavily discounted fuel and not being able to pass that RIN on because I made the mistake of not selling it. So in our case, selling on a fairly consistent basis helps. And, and you'll see here in the next slide, um, you know, RIN started down there at a couple of cents at the beginning of last year. You know kind of rapidly increasing all the way up to, oh, I think, I don't know if there was any sales made at that dollar thirty mark, but, you know, I had the fortune of selling some in excess of a dollar. And at that point, the E85, or excuse me, the E98, the, the ethanol that we purchased from the plants was kind of at an all-time high. You know, it was probably 250, 260, 270. And that was, uh, it seemed like, boy, how am I going to sell that E10, that E15, the E85, any of my blends, you know, when it, 
when, it, when you're sitting there looking at uh, E0 and, and E10 or E15 on the same playing field, people always will go to the gas pump and vote with their wallet. You know, it's, it's just a given. So nevertheless, at that time, you know, we were actually able to sell some of our RINs, which we try to do on, I like to say a monthly basis, but on occasion I don't have enough built up to, to be able to sell to, as, especially as a small volume producer. You know, so I got to build these up just a little bit. Um, but nevertheless, at $2.60 and, and or $0.70 cent ethanol, and you take a dollar off that ethanol, it made all those blends look extremely attractive. And I think it, uh, it also shows that in the times of lower RIN prices, the ethanol is a little bit cheaper. You, you can see our, our volume stayed at the lowest point with near zero RIN value, I was still selling on average every day of January, 16% of, or excuse me, 16% ethanol in every gallon of gas that we sold out of the station. And it went, uh, I wanna say it went all the way up to 20, 27% there in July. That's a big number. I mean, when you're talking about a gas station that's got E0 and E10 and maybe a 75, 25 split, What's that give you? Six, seven percent? Uh, and those are the people that, I, I guess they don't, uh, they're not complaining about the blend wall, but if you're not going to get out there and, and give this thing a try, you're going to be up against that blend wall and, and it's just good ammunition for the big oil, obviously, to, uh, to say, hey, look, 10 percent is all we can sell. If we mandate 10 percent across the country, that's all this country can produce, that's all we can use, and there we are, sitting here waiting on tomorrow's ruling. And I'm Bruce Fallon, and that's all I have for you today. And if you got any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer or do my best. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Bruce has indicated that uh, his customers haven't had any vehicle problems uh, when using E15, uh, but that hasn't uh, stopped uh, many of those who, who are opposing um, E15 and its compatibility with the vehicle model years for which it's been approved, um, despite EPA's grueling testing. Um, approval of E15 is probably one of the few things that EPA has gotten right, although we wish they would have expanded those model years out um, for approval to every vehicle on the road. But despite that, we do have the potential for another 7 billion gallons of ethanol blending in the 2001 and newer vehicles because those vehicles account for about 80% of all the fuel that's purchased on an annual basis. Um, the safety of ethanol, the compatibility of it um, is something that was looked into by uh, the DOE's National Renewable Energy Lab and they did a review of the multitude of studies that had been done on E15 on engines, the vehicle durability, the compatibility of the components. And so to share those findings on this research is Matt Ratcliffe. Uh, Matt is a senior scientist with the National Renewable Energy Lab's Transportation and Hydrogen System Center in Colorado. So his focus is on the intersection of fuel chemistry, internal combustion, engine performance, and exhaust emissions. His ongoing work includes ignition of diesel surrogates and investigation of the next generation biofuels and uh, direct injection spark ignition engines. Prior to uh, joining NREL, he was at the National Bioenergy Center for 14 years where he developed biomass gasification systems and syngas tar reforming catalysts for power generation and liquid fuel synthesis. Makes E15 sound easy. <laughs> With that, Matt, would you like to share your research? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> One of the governor's comments brought me a flashback. Um, it was uh, 1980, as a freshly minted organic chemist, I was given the opportunity to uh, attend a fuels from farm workshop. So this is back in the, the, the gas hall was the key word that triggered this memory. And um, by comparison with this trade show, it was, it was quaint. 
Um, basically, we have a little manual and basically uh, trying to teach uh, farmers how to make a still. <laughs> and so I, um, I'm kind of come full circle here to, uh, I'm really am, am amazed how far this industry has come. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start out by thanking my, uh, my coworkers on this project. Uh, Rob, Robert McCormick, Bob McCormick uh, is really the lead author on this. And my colleagues, Janet and, and Brad were, uh, big players in this study as well. So what we did, well, I really don't have to spend much time on this, this slide because I am preaching to the choir here with that one. Uh, but the question of why was 2001 uh, the, the critical year that, that EPA selected um, to approve E15-4. Um, the, the top chart shows the uh, Oxides of nitrogen emission standards, or also known as NOx emission standards, uh, that have been progressively getting stricter and stricter over the years. So, <clears throat> from 2001 to the to the present, uh, are the are we have have presently have very very low emission standards, and of course EPA. One of their concerns was not backsliding on the on that by implementing a new fuel. Um, the reason, one of the reasons that's a concern is, a couple of reasons that's a concern, was a concern for them, is shown in the, in the chart below that, where we, we see the curves of, of flame temperature for ethanol, butanol, and isooctane, which you consider, can consider a surrogate for gasoline, uh, as, as a function of air-fuel ratio, or la lambda. And it's generally true for fuels that just slightly lean, a little bit of excess air, is where the maximum flame temperature occurs when you're combusting a fuel. And the reason that's important in regard to NOx emissions is most of the NOx is formed uh, by a mechanism known as thermal NOx. In other words, the higher the temperature is, the more you make. And <clears throat> the second point of this chart is the blue vertical line is right at perfect stoichiometric air-fuel ratio. Uh, it, it's, that's extremely important for spark ignition engines to operate there because the three-way catalyst that cleans up the exhaust is really only effective at, at controlling NOx emissions right at that point, just a little bit on either side of it. And so their concern was that if increasing the amount of ethanol and gasoline uh, leaned out the fuel mixture too much, it would move away to the, to the right of um, to the, to the lean side of the combustion, make the, making the catalyst ineffective for uh, reducing those NOx emissions and moving it into moving the vehicle into a, a zone where you might incur um, piston damage or catalyst damage. So EPA's concern was ensuring that uh, emissions were not compromised by going to this new fuel, and furthermore, that the emission control systems on the cars over, over their lifetime was not uh, compromised. So what we did was uh, looked at 43 different studies, 33 of which were, were unique uh, studies, uh, were new studies of, of fuel and test fluid. I'll go into that in a sec, that discrimination in a second. Uh, effects on emissions, catalyst durability, evaporative emissions, uh, materials compatibility, and uh, onboard diagnostic um, trouble codes. Um, most of this research that we report it was conducted by the U.S. Department of Energy through either Oak Ridge or, or NREL and the Minnesota Center for Automotive Research as well as uh, the Coordinating Research Council. Caveats up front, um, it's very, very difficult to, to draw analysis, uh, study to study conclusions because in many cases, um, unique test fuels or fluids were used, testing protocols were not consistent across the board. But what we attempted to do was after, after, after reviewing each of these studies, we took the conclusions from those studies and tried to look at look for overarching conclusions that might be drawn from this body of research. 
Um, we expressly distinguish between test fuels and test fluids. Um, the test fluids mostly are in relation to materials compatibility. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but fluids are not the same as fuels. They're not designed to be fuels. They're supposed to be meant to test um, specific articles, fuel pumps or materials, for example. But their actual relationship to real world, world fuels is not really known. So we've called that out separately. And I'm going to jump ahead to the con conclusions, and we'll circle back to this after I drill into the details a bit. But the, uh, the, the highlights of our conclusions is that, that the 2001 and newer vehicles seem to be completely capable of, of a, adapting to E15 uh, without incurring any different, significant difference, certainly not in a negative sense, um, <clears throat> in regard to emissions. And we saw no effect of, on catalyst durability. Um, material studies showed that, that um, the difference between going from E0 to E10 was much, much larger than the incremental change in, in materials compatibility going from E10 to E15. And our bottom line conclusion from this is that E15 was really going to have little or no impact on, on 2001 and newer vehicles. Um, <clears throat> so the two sets of studies that are related here, emissions and catalyst durability studies, are the one set of data that is most easy to draw robust conclusions from, and that's because the, the fuels were very well defined. They had to meet uh, ASTM standards or certification fuel standards with, and then blended together. And the testing procedures were very, very well prescribed by EPA's own regulations. Uh, the photograph on the right shows vehicles undergoing catalyst durability testing. Uh, they're sitting on uh, mileage accumulation dynos. Uh, these, there was 82 vehicles that were included in this study that were uh, matched up in triplicate or, quad, uh, or four groups of four that were tested on, aged and tested on E0, E10, E15, and E20. And the, the mileage accumulation dynos racked up somewhere between 50 and 100,000 miles, depending on the individual, individual vehicle. Um, <clears throat> the table of data there uh, is, is showing exhaust emissions from a separate e emissions only study. Um, the key point I want to make here is that the, the, the data that's shown in, in the grade out area, those changes there are sign statistically significant changes relative to E0, which was the, the control fuel in this, in this study. And what this is, it is showing is really no surprise that as you add ethanol, fuel economy goes down a bit, ethanol emissions go up a little bit, acetaldehyde emissions go up a little bit, and carbon monoxide emissions go down a bit. Um, <clears throat> NMHC stands for non-methane hydrocarbons. You can just think, about, think of that as unburned hydrocarbons. Um, and the net effect of adding ethanol from E0 up to E20 was a decrease in those unburned hydrocarbons. So despite what happened with increasing ethanol emissions and acetaldehyde, when you add those particular oxygenate tailpipe emissions to the non-methane hydrocarbon emissions, you get the very top line, which is NMOG non-methane organic gases. That's the sum of the unburned hydrocarbons and ethanol and acetaldehyde, and there is no net effect there. Likewise for NOx, NOx emissions, there was no, no statistically uh, significant effect across going from E0 to E20. Uh, so. Um, one of the important points that we gleaned from, from these studies was that uh, because the catalyst durability was, wrote, there was really no difference between the rate of catalyst degradation between E15 uh, and E0, actually all of the fuels degraded at basically the, at the, at basically the same rate, that that implies that 
it strongly suggests that there was really no difference in those fuels in terms of, of catalyst durability. And, that, and, and that's also backs, you can step away back up from that and, and infer from it that the catalyst temperatures were not experiencing much, much higher temperatures. Uh, on materials compatibility, uh, most of these studies were done with te what, what I'm calling test fluids. Um, <clears throat> they used uh, a benchmark fuel known as Fuel C, which is really just a 50-50 a mixture of isooctane and toluene. It's supposed to be a surrogate for gasoline, but it in no way meets um, gasoline standards. That's why we, we're calling it a fluid. And those and, and fuel C, <clears throat> that gasoline surrogate, was blended with ethanol at various concentrations I'll discuss here in a moment. The top chart shows um, various metals and their corrosion rates. Um, and this is in, in millimeters per year of corrosion. And I need to point out that the vertical axis is a logarithmic scale. So between every single line is a factor of 10. And the takeaway from this is that, is that um, okay, the, and the two heavy bars at the top are, are considered by a couple of different studies to be insignificant uh, over a, a span of 20 years corrosion rates. Um, <clears throat> and so the takeaway from this top chart is that uh, for the most corrosion prone materials, which were uh, low carbon and mid, um, medium carbon steels, they were still 1,000 to 10,000 times um, less susceptible to corrosion than what was considered um, minimal. So E15, the, uh, E15 was as far as that, that study went. And I also note that there was 1% water in these test fluids, which accelerates, tends to accelerate corrosion. Um, there was really essentially no, no, no meaningful effect there. The, the, um, the bottom chart is a study of uh, elastomers that are sometimes used in fuel systems. And <clears throat> the, um, it's already well known that SBR is uh, styrene, butadiene, rubber, and silicone are not acceptable um, elastomers to be using in, in fuel, hydrocarbon fuel systems. That's why they're way off to the, to the, uh, the right in this chart, which is, is really a chart of, of um, the, the amount that the um, elastomer or the elastomer is swelling when it's immersed in this fluid over a, a set period of time versus the, the hardness of that. Uh, of that. Um, so it's plotting the, the amount of the material swelling versus how hard it is once the material's dried out, how that uh, integrity of that material has changed. And so all I want you to focus on then is th uh, in the upper, upper left-hand corner are two clusters of, of uh, materials known as nitrile butadiene rubbers and, and fluorocarbon rubbers, which are typically used in, in gasoline fuel systems. And if you just focus your attention on the NBR, the circle uh, around the NBRs, um, the fuel C or the surrogate for gasoline uh, is, in, is in the blue symbols in the upper left-hand corner. And uh, the, the, red, the red squares were the surrogate for, for E10 and the, and, the green, and the green triangles were the surrogate for, for E15. Um, you can see the spread in those indicating that the difference between gasoline and E10 was much, much greater than the difference between E15 and E10. Um, and the same, similar is true for the, for the fluorocarbon uh, elastomers, although they're, they're so robust that they really didn't seem to, to, to take much, much, didn't make much difference between those uh, fuels at all. Uh, Courtney Research Council undertook a study of fuel system components where they took uh, something on the order of 25 different fuel injectors, different uh, fuel pumps, and entire fuel system rigs and subjected them to long-term testing under these various conditions that are shown in that second, second row. And again, in this first round of testing, they were using an aggressive E20 flu fluid test fluid. And the intention here was to, uh, excuse me, test, test these materials for uh, 
to determine which ones were the most sensitive, and they down-selected to three fuel centers and, and four fuel pumps that seemed to be sensitive to this aggressive E20 formulation. And, and so they, starting with new but identical components, retested them with uh, a, an, an aggressive E15 and, uh, well, both aggressive and non-aggressive. The aggressive meaning that in addition to having ethanol and the gasoline surrogate in there, they were adding things like small but significant amounts of hydrochloric acid, um, acetic acid, things that would far, far ex at concentrations that would far exceed what would ever be uh, likely to occur in, in a fuel system in the, in the field. But the intention is to, to get acceler do accelerated testing. So they retested these, these, these uh, seven components to find which that parts failed on E15, but not on E10. And they found one fuel pump that consistently failed on E15. However, um, <clears throat> that fuel pump had, had not really failed on E20, so this, the results of the study ended up being really unconclusive because they didn't offer up any hypothesis as to why it didn't fail on E20 versus E15. So <clears throat> the results of the study were inconclusive is the bottom line. Then there, then there was the CRC engine durability study um, where they, they looked at uh, engines from eight different um, vehicles and tested them on, most of them were tested on a, on a, on a dynamometer, uh, intended in a dry, in dynamometer drive cycle where they removed the, in, they removed the engines from the vehicles and tested them on, on an engine dynamometer. And they, they ran a set of vehicles on E20 and if it um, passed that, then they would run another set of vehicles on E15 and if it passed that, then they would run it on E0. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to some of the criticisms that we had with this, concerns with, that we had with this study is that, uh, as I'll show you in the next slide, the drive cycle speeds seem to have been too, too low because there was one vehicle that failed all the way across the board, even on E0. Um, the study did not include any control testing on E10. Um, and very perplexing is that they, they used uh, dummy data in their statistical analysis, analyses to, uh, upon which they drove uh, derive their conclusions in this study. Uh, this list of failure criteria, just briefly, um, there were criteria for emissions failure, diagnostic trouble code failures, valve clearance problems, compression, uh, cylinder compression measurements, and cylinder leak down measurements. So this is a summary of the vehicles. The, uh, the study was blinded, so we don't know what these vehicles, well, we know what the vehicles were, but we don't know how they line up with these numbers. Uh, so they were blinded as vehicles one through eight. Um, vehicle eight, you see, is the one that, that failed across all fuels. And um, this ended up resulting in, in only two vehicles, number two and three, uh, seeming to have uh, problems with, with E15. However, we, we um, with, with all of the concerns that I raised in the previous slide, uh, these data, this study, are open to a different interpretation, and I offer that here, in that um, some of their failure criteria um, were somewhat arbitrary and not necessarily followed through on a rigorous basis. Uh, one vehicle that failed on emissions was, uh, at least one vehicle was, was beyond its useful life, and this leak down failure mode is not really a scientific methodology. Um, not all manufacturers have a leak down specification on their engines to, to determine when it's worn out. Um, leak down testing is really mostly done as a diagnostic tool to, to determine where an engine is starting to have a problem and, and whether the leak path is through the, past the valves or past the, the, uh, the piston rings is very important diagnostically, but even those uh, associations were not, were not reported. They just 
failed uh, uh, vehicles if they had a leak down rate that was 10% or greater at some point in the testing. Um, so we reanalyzed their, their data taking out, uh, including, including vehicle number eight, because that was one of the ways they, they did something odd with the statistics, was they completely disregarded vehicle eight from, from the study. Um, and then they, the, some of the dummy, what I meant by dummy data is that vehicles that, um, that they didn't test, all of those blank spaces, they put those things in as passes. So by, by looking at the statistics in a more uh, correct way of doing it, we determined that, that the, the probability of, of these vehicle failures being a result of being fueled on E15 is, is uh, much, much lower than they did. Um, <clears throat> there was another, uh, this one's a little bit out of order. Uh, this is going back to um, um, materials, I guess this is a uh, fuel system durability study. They used flu fluids. Uh, this is work that was done by Minnesota Car. Um, looked at uh, fuel systems over a long, yeah, this is long-term, 4,000-hour durability uh, testing. And <clears throat> all of the fuel pumps that they, that they tested showed minimal effect on E20, but um, the, the fuel, sen fuel sending units all seem to be pretty sensitive to this. But again, it's difficult to draw correlations between what these results are with these aggressive test fluids compared to a real-world E15 or E20 fuel. Um, <clears> the <throat> University of Minnesota also uh, undertook a fleet study. Um, <clears throat> so this is not an entirely rigorous study, but the scale of it with, with 80 total vehicles is, is, um, gives a compelling result. Basically, they ran uh, 40 pairs of vehicles, one on E0, one set on E0, E0 and one set on E20 over a year and found that at the end, at the end of that um, year plus period that there were really no fuel related maintenance problems or, or um, diagnostic trouble codes. Um, mal the malfunction indicator light on your dashboard, uh, it, one of the reasons that can get triggered are, are fuel system problems. Um, and they, they found no, no, no problems with that. So in conclusion, You've seen this slide before. We, we, saw, we, we found in, in our overarching conclusions from looking at these 33 unique studies that um, there was really no difference in, no net difference in cr critical um, emissions that are regulated by EPA and the cr catalyst durability was unaffected. Um, the materials studies showed that there's much, much greater difference between going from E0 to E10 than there is going from that extra 5% to E15. And <clears throat> the bottom line was, is our conclusion is, is likely, although we cannot prove this definitively because the study studies as large as they were and as expensive as they were are, are not uh, sufficiently robust to say this manufacturer is going to have X percent of failures of this component in such and such a period of time. But based on the totality of the data that we looked at, it seems to us very unlikely that E15 is going to have any uh, significant impact on the way 2001 vehicles and newer are going to operate. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any questions? If we do, um, if you'd please use the, the microphones. Um, but as we can see, we've had uh, flawed testing using flawed data out there. We've had 2,000 uh, model year vehicles tested. No problems. Um, so I, I was just wondering, Matt, um, what would actually happen if a 1999 vehicle actually used E15? Um. Is this working? Yeah. Um, the, the most likely thing that's going to happen is that the um, 
fuel system would not deliver enough fuel to, to, to keep the engine operating at that stoichiometric control point. And the engine control units uh, will set diagnostic trouble codes if, if the fuel trims on the, on the fuel injectors are getting too long. That is to say, if they, if they reach a point where um, they're having to deliver so much extra fuel that they can no longer uh, meet, meet what the, the control program is requiring, it will trigger a diagno that diagnostic trouble code mm -hmm. will tr trigger a light ash that um, will compel the owner to get it checked out. Mm -hmm. and so that, that's sort of the canary in the coal mine for each individual car is the onboard diagnostics. And probably one of the reasons EPA chose 2001 and newer is, is that um, the computers are much more sophisticated after that point to get to these ultra low emissions that they are now required to meet. Okay. All right. Thanks. So over here. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Bruce. Um, how did you determine how much of the RIN value to pass on to consumers? I mean, that's a, that's a question that um, we deal with with some retailers. Uh, they want to hold on to more uh, for their margins. Then the trade-off is, you know, they re reduce the volume of sales, reduce the foot traffic. How did you determine how much of the RIN value to pass through? Truly the million dollar question, isn't it? For some, it was a million dollar deal. Um, for us, you can base it on, on industry standards. Uh, what, your competition will always dictate what you have a chance to make on your product. As a blender, if my competition's down the street is, is selling $3 gas, I can sell $3 gas. The beauty of it is I can make a whole bunch more money selling that $3 gas. And, and I'm not saying that to answer your question directly on the RINs because there's profit is certainly not a dirty word. And if anybody in here has uh, ever been in the, the fuel or gas business, it's brutal. It, it's tons of time, lots of headaches, super low margins. I would say we passed on, for lack of giving you a, an accurate percentage or number, most of the RINs. And in our situation, that just drove so many more people to our door. Uh, and it, it gave those people that maybe wouldn't make that choice to, to push the E85 or the E30 button to go ahead and do it because it was so advantageous. Uh, and I'm not out there coaching these people, like I said, telling them one-on-one. -on -one. When we first did the blunders, I was. I mean, I was the guy saying, hey, if you got a flexible vehicle, go ahead and use it. But these people are going to make up their own minds due to the cost of the product. And if I can keep that cost low, if I can make my company a little bit more money, add on some employees, facilities, equipment, on and on. It goes with expenses. I, you just got to find your own balance in there, I, I guess is what I'm saying. And, and I don't do enough RIN volume to sell my RINs every day, every week, every month sometimes. Sometimes it's been up to two months before I sell some RINs. You know what the market on RINs can do in two months? Scary stuff. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, right up here. I have a, also a question for Bruce. And since he is uh, evidently a South Dakota native, after his answer, maybe Lucy can give me the Iowa version if there is a difference. Uh, when I started my driving career, we had two choices. We had regular and ethyl. Sometimes we put five gallon to regular and five gallon to ethyl to get the ping out of those big V8s, you know. And then it moved into my first experience with the blender pump. This is before ethanol was a Sunoco in West Des Moines that we could choose different octanes. I think we had about four or five choices, all 100% uh, fuel, no ethanol, but that was my first exposure to a blender pump. And if I remember, I think there were just one hose and one nozzle. Okay, my question is, with the variety of product that you've got in your blender pump, do you or your insurance agent feel you need some kind of coverage for one of your clients, maybe even from Iowa, that fills up either deliberately or accidentally with wrong product and claims he has um, uh, mechanical pro engine problems due to 
fueling at your station. Do you think you're agent or do you feel any need for any, any insurance coverage? Maybe it's not even available because as I would understand it, there's no restriction. Years ago, a, a regular leaded nozzle was so big you couldn't put it in a car that wanted it only. But I'm assuming I could put 85% in my 55 Ford if, if, if I wanted to and you wouldn't be able to detect it or stop them. Do you have the need for insurance coverage? You know, you, you can't protect people from themselves. Um, <laughs> do, you do your due diligence. Very well-labeled pumps. And, and I've had this conversation before with, with other people. Uh, I don't know that it's actually the gas station's liability. If I see you putting your 85 in your 55 Ford, I'm going to come and talk to you. Um, and trust me, people have been mixing their own cocktails since ethanol was available in a high percentage. Um, to answer your question, no, I don't have insurance for it. I don't know if it is available. Anybody that's putting E15 in their 2001 newer car and can prove to me that it destroyed their engine, left them sitting on the side of the road, I'd foot the bill. And I'm not just saying that. I mean, that's, that's the kind of people we are, and that's what I would do. I'm that confident in our equipment, in our product, in, in ethanol. And typically in Iowa, um, we have the, we've investigated this as well. We've met with uh, uh, insurance companies and um, the, the major insurance company for the retailers in Iowa cover all fuels, E15, E85, E30. Um, it's something you add to your current insurance policy. We've been told that um, it's just part of your regular coverage. So we also have retailer liability protection in Iowa that does protect retailers if there is a misfeeling. But if it's labeled properly um, and the consumer does the misfeeling themselves, our retailers are covered. So we have one more question in the back, and then I'm sorry we have to move on. But they will be here. You can ask them. Hi, Tim, Minnesota Biofuels Association. Uh, retailer and a science question uh, for Hill <laughs> Front. Um, how are you dealing with the uh, off-season sale of E15, the June, September, and then on the science, uh, knowing that the elastomeric components have passed the E15 test, what's the rationale for the reed vapor pressure uh, problem that we have? So the practical, what's a retailer do, and what's the science tell us about the reed vapor pressure? Yeah, as a station owner, you've got one option when you're selling E15, and that is in, in low RVP season, you switch your labels to a flex fuel vehicle only label. And then in, obviously in the, in the normal seasons, you can put it as a standard fuel for 2001 and newer vehicles. So it's, it's a little bit of uh, paying attention to the calendar and changing your labeling. That's about the extent of it for us. Um, on the RVP question, it's... Um, Because an elastomer swells doesn't necessarily um, lead to a, a change in, in the fugitive emissions from a, from a component. That's more to do with permeation through a material. It's, it's different than um, if, if an, an elastomer, say an O-ring, fails, you're likely to get a fluid leak. <clears throat> um, and so the, 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 the two things that you bring up are not really directly related. Um, RVP is more of a concern in regard to refueling emissions in, in these day, this day and age because the, uh, there, there is so, there's so much evaporative uh, vapor control on the cars that very little escapes once the fuel system's closed up again. Okay. Well, thank you, Bruce and Matt, very much. Let's give them another round of applause.